today I want to begin with a story. Um, about six years ago, I attended a, a two-day seminar called Halftime. And it was designed for people who had uh, had a pretty busy first half and wanted to take some time out, reflect on that, and think about the, the next half of their life. There's about 15, 16 people in this two-day seminar, kind of ages 40 to 50 plus. And uh, as I reflected on my first half, I just finished up a 32-year job uh, in, in, in a large church and had been really pretty busy. I was a little bit burnt out. And uh, so it was a lot of time reflecting on where you've been and where you want to go, what you want to be different. And so for me, I, I realized that um, my inflow was a lot smaller than my outflow. Um, probably 20% inflow, 80% outflow. I was giving out, speaking, leading, planning. You know, There's a lot of outflow, but the inflow was lower, and I, I'd started to run a little bit on empty. And so my, my, my dream for the future was kind of, wow, what, what if it could be 50-50, even or, or even a higher inflow? You know, I, my, my gifts are leading and, and teaching. And I discovered that if I've taken some time to get a sense of direction, I really love leading. <laughs> but if I haven't had time to get that direction, just leading itself wasn't energizing for me. If I've had time to think and reflect and learn and grow and study, then I love communicating. But if I hadn't had much inflow, just speaking alone was actually not energy. So uh, energizing for me. So uh, I had this kind of dream of changing the flow of my life to balance the inflow and the outflow. And so that was kind of my uh, two-day reflection. There was an artist in the room, and uh, he created a little plaque for each one of us. And uh, the plaque that he presented to me is right here. Uh, you probably won't see it, so I'll put a copy of it up on the screen for you. And so he gave me this plaque with the word flow on it, and everyone in the seminar signed it at the back. And so I have this on my desk. And it's a picture of a beach, this idea of the tide going out and in, breathing out, breathing in, and just finding a sense of flow. And I found that really significant for me. Sometimes when it gets real busy, it's a reminder for me just to pause and take a good breath in uh, so that I'm not just giving out all the time. And so that was about, um, about six years ago that happened. A couple of years after that, Nicole and I decided we want to do a little bit more outdoor activity, so we bought a couple of kayaks, and uh, we eventually got them down to uh, Phillip Island, and uh, my first time out on the kayak, I was uh, in Cape Ulamai, I took a photo of it right here, and it's a New Zealand brand, and I didn't notice until I took the kayak out that this particular model is called the Flow. <laughs> Doo-doo. <laughs> There's that word flow again. Um, a year later, a number of us were doing a course on supervision, professional supervision. And on the first day of the course, they were talking about curiosity and just being open and living more spontaneously. And the lecturer in the very first session quoted a fantastic Irish poet, uh, author, priest uh, named John Donahue. O'Donohue. Look, look him up. He, he's great. And this was their opening statement. I would like to live like a river flows, carried by the surprise of its own unfolding. Isn't that beautiful? I'd like to live like a river flows, carried by the surprise of its own <laughs> unfolding. Here was this word flow again. Uh, and then the same year, you know, in my education, I did a lot of theological studies. I also did some business studies, a diploma in business management. Looking back, I wish I did some studies in psychology and sociology and philosophy, like I, like I love learning. And so I decided to start reading a bit on philosophy. And so I, I got an introduction to philosophy. Of course, they go right back to all the Greek philosophers, 500 BC. And so first day, just diving in on, on a day off, and I'm reading about this guy named uh, Heraclitus. There's a good baby name if you're looking for um, Heraclitus. And Heraclitus lived in a time where the, all the other philosophers felt the world, the universe was static. It was unchanging. And so he started to think, he, he would just look at a river and go, I'm not sure everything's static. And so he uh, had an, a, a very famous statement. Here it is right here. The, we, we don't have a photo, but there's a, a statue of Heraclitus. And one of his famous statements is, Panta Ray, everything flows. I'm reading a book on philosophy, a guy 500 BC, and he's saying everything 
flows. Everything is a state of flux. He was the one who also said, no one ever steps in the same river twice, for it's not the same river and it's not the same person. Funny, my dad, who's passed away when we were kids, he used to say, just go with the flow. (laughs) Be flexible, be adjustable, just go with the flow. Can you see a little bit of a pattern, a little bit of a theme here? And then I was reminded of, uh, anyone heard of Jesus? Jesus, on John 7, on the last great day of the feast, he stood up and said, Let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the Scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow. There's that book again. And around this time, I'm kind of getting a message. And I actually remembered a prophecy, and we will in this series talk about prophecy. But when I was 19, I had a few people share some words of encouragement over me, and, and I had it on a cassette. Anyone remember cassettes? And, and I'd written it out, and I pulled it out, and there was this prophecy from this woman pastor named Rosella Fox, and she says to me, there's been an excitement about life. You've been excited about living. God's put that in your heart. It's like you're by a river watching it flowing, flowing on, and wondering in your heart, where is that river flowing? And it just goes on and says, you know, Jesus is that river, and there's a thirst in your heart, and you can uh, flow in that river. Ten times in that prophecy, the word flow was mentioned. This is when I was 19 years of age. And so... It's like this word, flow, for me, has become a bit of a theme in my life, a little bit of a a pattern of God speaking to me. (laughs) How many know sometimes once you see something, you see it everywhere? Uh, I, uh, six years ago, got a little red Suzuki Swift, Nicole says, every teenage girl's dream, Uh, but I... (laughs) I, I loved that Swift, and you know, when I had that little red Swift, um, everywhere I saw was red cars. Uh, sadly, three weeks ago, <laughs> I was in a four-car pileup on the freeway. The guy behind us didn't see the traffic slowing and hit us at 100 k's an hour. Thankfully, I feared left and was moving, but my car was right off, and none of us were hurt. So I uh, said goodbye to the Suzuki Swift, and at my family's instruction, I now have a white double cab. I've only been driving in a week, but you know there's white double cabs everywhere? <laughs> it, it is interesting that you tend to see what you're looking for. But, but, but you know, flow is not just that for me. It's not as if, well, it's just you're, you're seeing what you're looking for. I believe that there's something in that word for me. Um, I, I wonder for you today, is there a word? Is there a phrase? Is there a a theme, a pattern in your life that maybe you haven't noticed and maybe you haven't discerned it as God speaking to you. I quoted this in my last message. I love this uh, uh, quote here from Frederick Bruckner. He says, listen to your life. Listen to what happens to you because it is through what happens to you that God speaks. For me lately, it's been flow, 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 flow. And it's just a reminder to breathe in, and breathe out, to receive, and then to pass on. I wonder what word, what theme, what pattern God may be wanting to speak to you through your life today. And so I'm doing a series of messages with you called Everyday Experiences with the Divine. And today, my story is flow. Last time, I talked about a little prompting to move into the light. We're looking at ways that we can experience God just in the everyday of our life. Here at Bayside, the theme this year is connectivity. And so we're looking at how we can connect more with God in our daily lives. Uh, We looked at the fact that God is actually everywhere. Paul said, in Him we live and move and have our very being. And so God is beyond us and yet beside us and yet also living within us. And the Christian life is not just meant to be a religion where we have certain beliefs and even certain behaviors, but it's meant to be an experience, an experience with God. We quoted Karl Rahner, who said, the Christian of the future will be a mystic or will not be a Christian at all. What's he saying? He's saying, unless you have an experience with God, unless there's this knowing of God personally for you, then you've really just got religion rather than a relationship with God. And so we're looking at ways that we can experience the divine, experience God each day of our life. I love this prayer of St. Patrick of Ireland. Christ with me, Christ before me, Christ behind me, Christ in me, Christ beneath me, Christ above me. 
Christ on my right, Christ on my left, when I lie down, when I sit down. Christ at the heart of everyone who thinks of me, everyone who speaks of me. Christ in the eye that sees me, in the ear that hears me. And so we're endeavoring to wake up and to be more aware of God in the everyday experiences of our life. A word like flow, an encouragement to move into the light. I wonder where God may be wanting to get your attention even today. Today, we want to talk particularly about experiencing God in the sacred word, the sacred word or the Bible as we know it. We'll start with a verse in Timothy that says this, all scripture is God-breathed and useful for teaching, for rebuking, for correction and training in righteousness or in right living, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every work. Uh, Paul's writing to a young uh, prodigy that he's training, and he's saying that the Scripture, the, the, the sacred word, the sacred text, is been breathed into by God, and it's profitable for four things, for teaching, for rebuking, for correcting, and for training in righteousness. So I have a little diagram that comes to mind when I read that. The purpose of the Bible is to teach us. It then grabs our attention, rebukes us when we get off track, and then it corrects us, helps us get back on track, and then hopefully trains us so that we don't just keep repeating the same cycles over and over, but we learn to live in a way that brings life to ourselves and those around about us. A, a couple of stories of how the Bible has done this for me, and uh, if you've heard these before, apologies, I've only lived one life, so I do have limited material. Um, <clears throat> when I was a teenager... Um, you know, I was kind of in and out of church. I'm a preacher's kid, so growing up in church, and you know, you go to youth camp, and the next Sunday you're on the front row, and then you know, a few months later you're kind of drifted to the back row. No judgment there on where you're sitting today, uh, but you know, I was kind of up and down, in and out. And um, I had a friend at school named Steve, and this is this is back last century pre CCTV days, and we were into bicycles in those days. And so Steve was kind of going into the local Kmart. And, and stealing little additions for the bicycle, you know. And uh, I didn't want to steal because stealing was wrong, but I was helping him. Don't look at me so spiritual. Uh, so I'd go down an aisleway and I'd kind of open a packet, you know, with a bike lock. And then I'd walk off and he'd come and steal the bike lock, you know. And so we were doing a little bit of this in our spare time, confession uh, time. And, 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 you know, I was still going to church occasionally. In fact, I was still reading my Bible. <laughs> and I'll never forget, one morning I opened my Bible, Proverbs 21, tw 29, 24, in the old Living Bible. And it says this, whoever is a partner to a thief is a fool. <laughs> oh my goodness, did God have my attention? It was a rebuke. <laughs> and you know what? I immediately got on the phone and said, hey, Steve, I'm out. I'm done. You know, I'm thankful for that rebuke. I wonder what the trajectory of my life could have been if I hadn't opened the Bible that day, heard that rebuke, made a correction, and got back on track with my life. Now, I wish that happened every day. Not the rebuke, but the profoundness of that. A few years ago, a funny story, we were living semi-rural in Melbourne, and we had a long driveway, and our neighbor had a couple of sheep. And uh, it was summertime, and they hadn't been shorn for a long time, so they're very woolly. And on the hot days, one or two of them would fall over and couldn't get back up. And so I'd have to go knock on our neighbor's door and say, hey, hey, one of your sheep's fallen over. And so the neighbor would come down and lift the sheep. It happened a few times. And uh, one Saturday morning, true story, I was uh, just in a, I had a coffee, and I was actually just reading my Bible, having a bit of quiet time. And Nicole goes, one of the sheep's fallen over again. And I literally said, I'm not going up there again. I'm not going up there. So I kept reading in my Bible, Matthew 12, 11, And Jesus said to them, if any of you has a sheep <laughs> and it falls into a pit on the Sabbath, will you not take hold of it and lift it up? <laughs> I jumped out of my chair. I said, I'm going, honey. <laughs> Can you believe it? How, how, like... Just coincidence, isn't it? <laughs> Unbelievable. That's what Paul's saying. You know, the Bible is beneficial for teaching you the right way to live and rebu rebuking you when you get off track and correcting you and getting you on the right path. 
Now, what I thought I'd do today, uh, something a little bit different, uh, I want to do a little Bible 101. Um, we're going to, just for about 10 minutes, fasten your seatbelts. We're going to go really fast. It'll be like a little Bible college course. And to change the metaphor, it'll feel like drinking from a fire hydrant just for a few moments. So just take in what you can. Some of you, this will be review. But I just realized for some, maybe you haven't heard uh, some of this background to this sacred word, to the Bible. And so just stay with me. Uh, we will land and we will bring this to hopefully a really helpful application. You know, the Bible is probably one of the most unique books in our uh, in our culture today. It was written over a period of 1,500 years, if you can imagine that. Forty different authors, kings, peasants, fishermen, poets, statesmen. It, it was written in different places, a wilderness, a prison, a dungeon, <laughs> while traveling, three different languages. It's incredibly diverse, so many controversial subjects, but it kind of speaks with this one united voice. It's been more widely read and published than any other book. It's survived the test of time, persecution, and criticism. Its teachings have had a huge impact, and it's still influencing lives today. How did we get our Bible? Thank you for asking. Uh, here's, here's a process. Uh, first of all is revelation. Unless God reveals to us, then there's certain things we will never no, And so it begins with revelation, and then it moves to inspiration, where we just read the Holy Spirit breathes into human writers to write down and to record things. The Bible didn't fall out of the sky, nor was it dictated to people in some kind of trance. We like to say the Bible was divinely given, but humanly composed. Divinely given, but humanly composed. And so uh, God revealed to certain people and inspired them to, to write down stories and experiences. And so then we have the original documents, most likely papyrus or tablets of stone. None of the original documents exist today. They've all deteriorated. They've all disappeared. They're all, all gone. We have none of the originals. That's why, number four, transmission is so important. There was a group called the scribes, and their entire profession was transcribing sacred texts, copying them very carefully so to preserve them for the next generation. And they did so with great reverence and great fear to make sure that not one full stop, comma, uh, jot or tittle, to use a Bible phrase, was lost in the transmission. Then we have canonization. That's not a weapon. Uh, the, the, the word canon means measuring rod in the Greek. And so the canon was how do we determine whether these books are inspired and to be included in the sacred text. And so the, the canon was the formation of the, Bi the books that are in the Bible today. The Old Testament canon was formed around 40 to 70 uh, BC by the Jewish community. These were the books of the Old Testament, 39 of them that were believed to be inspired. The canon of the New Testament wasn't formed till about the 4th century AD, and there was quite a bit of debate about which books should be in and which books should be out. And so that's how the books got determined to be in the Bible. And then we have translation. Unless you speak Hebrew or Aramaic or Greek, then you can't read the Bible. Uh, thankfully, we have translations today, and many of them, uh, of course, in English. There's three types of translations. A literal translation, like the King James, the New King James, or the author authorized. That's like a word-for-word -word translation. We then have a dynamic equivalent, which is kind of the nearest, nearest um, essence of the thought in the text. And then we have a paraphrase. Anyone heard of the Message Bible? That's a paraphrase. So uh, where Jesus is talking to Satan, he says, get behind me, Satan. The Message Bible says, beat it, Satan. Can, can you see the difference? It's not kind of word for word. It's a, a bit of a paraphrase. And so this is how we got the Bible that uh, you might have in your hand or on your uh, device today. Revelation, inspiration, original documents, uh, transmission, canonization, and then translation. Everyone doing okay? Today, quick Bible college class. The Bible has different types of literature. There's law, prophets, writings, gospels, the book of Acts, Paul's letters, general epistles, and revelation. 
Uh, the books of the Bible are grouped by genre or type. So we have all the Pentateuch, we have all the historical books, we have all the wisdom literature, we have all the prophets, then we have all the Gospels, and then we have all the letters, and then Revelation. Uh, that's helpful in one way, but in another, it doesn't help us know the narrative or the story. And so if you're really interested in the Bible, I would encourage you to get what's called a chronological Bible unbelievable tool. Because what it does, it puts the Psalms and the prophecies in the historical context. So for instance, the book of Psalms is 150 collected Psalms. You know, one of them was written by Moses. So what it does in Genesis, uh, in Exodus, when we have the story of Moses, it puts Psalms 90 in there. So you're reading Psalms 90 in the context of Moses. When there's a prophecy, it takes the prophet and it puts the prophet in the historical context. In the book of Acts, when Paul is in a certain city and he writes a letter to Galatia, it puts the book of Galatians in there so you can read the narrative and it, it really helps you get an understanding of the story of the Bible. Just a suggestion. A couple of other books. The Septuagint is a Greek translation of the Old Testament. The Apocrypha, 17 other books between the Testaments that are in Catholic Bibles but not in Protestant Bibles. And uh, that's because they're believed to be interesting historically but not necessarily inspired and authoritative. And then has anyone heard of the Gnostic Gospels? You've obviously watched the Da Vinci Code. Uh, the Gnostic Gospels were other Gospels written in the 2nd and 3rd century by people like Thomas, Peter, and Mary, and Magdalene, Mary Magdalene, but not included in our Bible. So, how were the books in the Bible determined? Uh, let's look at a couple of words here. As apostolicity. Was it written by an apostle or his companion? Antiquity. Can it be dated back to the apostolic era Orthodoxy, was it aligned with the church's teaching? And Catholicity, uh, was it widely used by the churches? So the four Gospels we have, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, were all connected with or written by an apostle. They were all dated early in the first century. They all aligned with the general views of what Jesus said and did, and they were the most widely accepted books. So a uh, couple more minutes. Here's the grand narrative. I want you to memorize this. There will be a test at the end. Here's the grand narrative of the Old Testament. Uh, as we look at it, down the bottom of the books of the Bible. And so we've got 11 chapters of what's called prehistory, creation, fall, the flood. Then we have history beginning with Abraham through to Moses. And then Samuel saw the kings through to Solomon. And then Solomon's sons divided the kingdom, the northern kingdom of Israel, eventually went into Assyrian captivity and never returned to the land. They're called the Lost Ten Tribes. If you want to have a fun Google search, search the Lost Ten Tribes where they are today. The southern kingdom was two tribes, Judah Benjamin, and they went into Babylonian captivity but came back to Jerusalem and were in the land during uh, those 400 silent years from Malachi right through to John the Baptist. So that's the Old Testament narrative, and all of the books fit around that story. And one way to help you kind of handle the Bible is to realize the Old Testament is ancient Israel's record of their experience with God. And then we move forward to the New Testament, a similar diagram. And the New Testament starts with Jesus' birth, his death, resurrection, and then we see the gospel spreading. Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, ends of the earth, right through to John on the Isle of Patmos. And all of the books of the New Testament fit around that narrative. And again, a great way to handle the New Testament is to realize this is a record of the first followers of Jesus' experience with God. And so that's a very brief Bible 101. Did you survive that? There's a lot there, but just a bit of a background of what the Bible is and how we got it. Um, just bringing that to a practical next thought, how do we benefit from the Bible? Well, First of all, just, just reading the Bible. Maybe you've never read the Bible. Just uh, a lot of people, even people that don't like the Bible, you ask, have you ever read it? Uh, just opening it, reading it. Find a translation that's easy to read. If you don't like to read, listen to an audio. Unless you know what it says, then you can't really benefit from it or even make a judgment on it. Secondly, it, it is to study the Bible. Not only what does it say, but what does it mean? 
the Bible was written in a totally different time, place, and culture. And we need to first ask, what did it mean back then before we go, what does it mean for us today? Uh, you know, even the Ethiopian who was uh, on the road, Philip came along and he was reading from Isaiah. And, and the Ethiopian goes, who's the prophet talking about? He, he, he was reading, but he didn't understand. He needed someone to explain. The disciples on the road to Emmaus, they're trying to figure stuff out. And Jesus comes along and it says, Jesus opened the scriptures to them so they could understand what it was about. And so studying is important. Getting a good study Bible. I brought one of my study Bibles today. Yep, they're really big. And a good study Bible has introductions to the books and notes and comments and helps you understand uh, what the Bible is saying. And then, of course, number three is to obey, to put it into practice. This is where wisdom comes from. How do I apply this to my life? James says, don't only hear the word, but do it. Put it into practice. Uh, he says, the, the Bible's a bit like a mirror. Uh, anyone look in the mirror this morning? How many know the mirror never lies? But the mirror doesn't fix your hair. <laughs> the, the mirror doesn't shave you, for those who need to shave. The, the mirror doesn't wipe the dirt. The mirror shows you what reality is, but you've got to do something about that. And the Bible is very much like that. We need to apply it to our lives. You know, uh, Bible reading. There was a, a survey done quite a few years ago by one of the largest churches in America, Willow Creek. And they in, engaged this company to put a survey together. And their question was, for all the programs and ministries of our church, are people becoming like Jesus? Pretty good question, huh? So they put this survey together, and the congregation did the survey. And you know what? The, the insight from the survey, it's called the Reveal Survey, came back. For all of the, the programs, ministries, everything good in the church, the one thing that came out of that survey was for people that on a regular basis opened the Bible, reflected upon it, applied it to their life, that was the number one factor for them becoming like Jesus. They paid a lot of money just to learn it's probably a pretty good idea to read the Bible if you're a Christian. That, that survey went all around the world. Many other churches did it. You know the church that scored the highest was a church in Hawaii. Not because it's in Hawaii, but Wayne Kadiro was the pastor there at that time. And for eight years in a row, he had the church reading through the Bible every year, doing this. Anyone heard of soap? Washing of the water by, water, washing of the, water by the word. Read a scripture make an observation, say, how does this apply to my life, and then pray. For eight or nine years, his entire church had been doing this with the Bible. Their church scored the highest on Christ-likeness. Just the power of reading God's Word and applying it to your life. And so as we talk about everyday experiences with the divine, maybe there's something in the, in the Bible for you, and maybe it's just starting a habit. Start small. Uh, funny story I was a youth pastor many years ago, and I met another youth pastor in America that wanted to train his youth group in reading the Bible. So, he, he, at youth meeting on Friday night, he said, Okay, I got a challenge for you this week. I bet you can't do it. I want you to touch your Bible every day this week. If you open your Bible, you're out of this youth group. Now, how many know to touch your Bible? You got to find your Bible. This is pre digital, I know, so last century. Anyway, next week, guess what? They all came back and said, I did it. I did it. I touched my Bible. He says, okay, this week, I want you to get your Bible, open the front flap, and close it. If you read one verse in this Bible, you're out of this youth group. I bet you can't do it. You know what? They all came back and said, I did it. I did it. I did it. Third week, he said, okay, I want you to open your Bible and read one verse. If you read two verses, you're out of this youth group. Parents were calling up complaining. We've got a youth pastor telling our kids not to read the Bible. <laughs> What was he doing? He was training in the habit. You know, find your Bible, open your Bible, read one verse. After three weeks, they were into the habit of reading their Bible. Under project, over perform. Touch it, open it, one at a time. What about you in the Bible today? You ever read the Bible? Maybe you're here going, yeah, yeah, preach it, Mark. Maybe this is a regular discipline for you. Maybe for some of you haven't even read the Bible and not interested or haven't known much about it, or, or maybe you read it and struggle with it. Come on. Who got stuck in Leviticus? 
Maybe you struggle with it. Maybe, you know, some of the violence, some of the uh, supposed discrepancies and contradictions, and sometimes people struggle or stumble over the Bible. Ultimately, we need to see Jesus as the center of the Bible story and the Bible as a progressive revelation. Have you noticed that it progresses? Even Jesus said, you know, it used to be an eye for an eye, but eye for an eye, you know, return vengeance for vengeance. But I, I want to tell you, pray for your enemy. Can you see there's a progression? And Jesus said, I'm going to send the Spirit, and the Spirit's going to lead you into all truth. You know, slavery was still around in Bible times. It took 1,700 years for humans to figure out, I don't think God wants us to enslave other humans. But, but there's been growth. There's been progression. And, and so maybe the Bible's been a bit of a stumbling block for you. I'm not sure. But I want to encourage you that I think there's a way to experience God through the sacred word. Uh, a few years ago, a few years ago, a few weeks ago, when I was preparing this message, I uh, felt to just finish with a, a story from the Gospels. And so I'm going to do that. And I want to just put up something that you may have heard of. Uh, it's a bit of a variation on soap, and it's called Lecto Divina. Anyone heard of that before? Lecto Divina? If you did Latin in school, you'd be very excited right now. It's been around since the, the first century. Lecto means read. And divina means sacred. And so lecto divina is a form of sacred reading. Uh, there is the word lectio, which is the first word, simply to read, to read the sacred text. Then there's the word meditato, which is to, to reflect, to pause, and just uh, let the word sink in and see if something emerges. And then there's oratio, which means to respond, to Talk to God about what comes through the text. And then contemplatio, which is just to rest and to be silent in that moment. This is not Bible study, and there's, there's a place for Bible study. Um, it, it's not an intellectual exercise at the head level. It, it's more about the heart. It's more about encountering the divine through the words of the sacred text. It's opening yourself up to the presence of God, mysteriously, as it were, hidden in the text and also in your life. And so we're not studying it like a textbook. Uh, we're not wanting to learn more about God. We're actually wanting to encounter God and experience God personally through, through the text. I, I chose this, uh, this story from the Gospels three or four weeks ago, and I, I just wonder whether, you know, Last few moments, that there might be something for me and for you in this story today. It's the story of Jesus stilling the storm. Let, 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 let me read it to you. On that day when evening had come, Jesus said to them, Let us go across to the other side. And leaving the crowd behind, they took him with them in the boat, just as he was. Other boats were with him. A great windstorm arose, and the waves beat into the boat, so that the boat was already being swamped. But Jesus was in the stern, asleep on the cushion. And they woke him up and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? And waking up, Jesus rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Be silent, be still. And then the wind ceased, and there was a dead calm. He said to them, why are you afraid? Have you still no faith? And they were filled with great fear or awe and said to one another, who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? I wonder if there are any particular words that stood out to you or thoughts from that story. I noted that although they were in God's will, there was still a storm. You kind of think if you're doing what's right, everything will be smooth sailing. Here's this great storm, a great windstorm, waves being swamped. And maybe for you today, that resonates with how you feel. We live in a world right now with incredible storms, the, the war in Gaza, the 
ongoing war in Ukraine, a, a horrible stabbing in Sydney shopping centre yesterday. I didn't know Hannah, but I, I wonder what storms she was battling. With. Maybe for you today, it's, it's a sickness or a loved one that you're concerned about. Storms, part of, part of life. And I don't know about you, but when I'm in a storm, I, I often say, where is God? <laughs> where is God? And I wonder whether these disciples were... Asking that too. What, what's amazing is Jesus is actually in the boat. He, in the middle of the storm. And I just had this little phrase come to me this week. Silence is not absence. Maybe for you, God's silent right now in your storm. But silence is not absence. Just because you're not hearing from God doesn't mean God is not with you in the storm. Teacher, do you not care? <laughs> that, that jumped out to me. God, don't you care? I think sometimes in the contradictions and sufferings of life, we, we wonder, does, does God care? I think this story would tell us that God does. We see Jesus waking and Speaking to the storm, be silent, be still. The wind ceasing and there was a dead calm. The, the, the word calm really stands out to me. I, I think we all have a longing for calm, for peace. I imagine Hannah was longing for calm. We all want peace. Hopefully, in this life, if not the next. And Jesus comes to, to bring that calm for us today. There are a few things that spoke to me from this story. I wonder about you today. Jesus said, the words I speak to you are, are spirit and life. You know, the, the text can be alive. and We can all... Receive something different from it today, but something unique, something just for you. Let's just take a moment to pause now. Dear God, today, thank you for the sacred text. Someone took time to write this story down, not just so we could remember it or study it, but experience the God who is active in this moment. I don't know who all's in the room or who's watching today, but I'm, I'm sure there's some people in a storm right now. The waves are battering their boat, battering their life. And they may be wondering, God, where are you? And I pray today that this story would just remind them that you are in their boat, in their life, in their story. Maybe people are saying, God, do you care? God, do you care? And this shows us that Jesus does care. And most of all, I pray today for all of us to experience an unbelievable sense of calm. May your peace Come into our world, come into our lives, come into our story today. We ask this in Jesus' name. Everyone said amen? amen? Amen. So I pray for you as you consider this theme of everyday experiences with the divine, that maybe just turning to the sacred word, just uh, maybe you got a bit of dust on an old Bible, I don't know, maybe, maybe this week, just... Uh, to see what God may speak to you and carry you through the sacred word. God bless you. Thank you.